full house today. I'm glad to see you all. My name is Dr. Brad Gunlock. I've been teaching history here at Trinity College since 1999. Can't believe how the time has gone by, actually. And you know, here at Trinity, we like to say, and we mean it, that we want to worship the Lord our God with our minds. And Scott Samuelson, our chaplain, asked me if I would speak today about Christian faith and the study of history. So I'm inviting you today to think with me about Christian faith and the study of history. Can we get my PowerPoint up there? Let's hope this works. Oh my, that's not very visible. Can you see that there are three faces trying to stare at us out of the past up there? Can you see that? Hopefully the other ones will be a little brighter. Okay. These are fragments of stirrup pots, portrait stirrup pottery that was made by the Moche Indians or their forebears in pre-Columbian contact South America. We're talking about maybe 900 AD or something like that. You can see these at the Chicago Art Institute, not too far from here. I took this, uh, this picture years ago and I like the way these faces seem to be trying to reach out to us from the past. Across the divide of time and culture. This to me, again, I hope you can sort of tell, there are, you know, like a bit of an eye here, a bit of a nose there. To me, this is a great image of the frag fragmentary but alluring nature of the study of history. Could we have the next slide? That's kind of stretched. I think next time I won't use slides, but here we are. OK. I don't know if you can tell what's going on here. This is actually an upside down slide. When I was uh, in Europe with my wife around the time of our second anniversary quite a few years ago, uh, we were visiting some friends in Heidelberg, and they suggested that we go to this place called Schwetzingen, which was the summer home of the prince electors of the Palatinate back in the days of the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, there were some wonderful gardens there. And among these gardens was this interesting sort of Orientalist attempt at a, I guess it was supposed to be a kind of Turkish-looking um, building in the middle of these gardens, and it had this lovely pond in front of it with a mirror-like surface. And I asked my wife to reach down and touch her hand to the water. Uh, maybe you can see her over there trying to do that. But this slide is actually upside down. Could you uh, go to the next one? There's how it actually was, okay? When I was showing the slides to some friends, I put the slide in the wrong way. Could we go back to the previous slide now? And it ended up looking like this. And this again to me, I thought, whoa, how artistic. <laughs> this gave me a wondrous feeling of touching a lost world. It looks like the reflection of my wife is reaching down to touch us. A wondrous feeling of touching a lost world, a world like our own, yet not exactly the same. A mirror of ourselves helping us understand ourselves. Oh, that's deep. Yet for us, it's just an image, a partial reflection of the full-bodied reality. And I thought, this makes a pretty good image of history. We try to sort of look into the mirror of history to learn a little bit more about ourselves. History, after all, is a discipline that has a lot to do with identity, belonging to a heritage, to a culture, our common identity as human beings across cultures and times. We look into the past. We try to recover in an informed historical imagination the reality that was. But it's always kind of like this. It's always an illusion. It's never the real full-bodied reality that once was. And we, as students of history, must always bear that in mind. Could we go ahead two slides? Okay. 
the bulk of my time today, I would like to spend taking you through some scripture verses that relate to how I, as a Christian, think about history. And I want to invite you to think about history in these ways, too. So let's start with Psalm 90. Next slide. We heard the whole thing read for us just a few minutes ago. Psalm 90, verse 1 says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. I got my start in history with an interest in generations. When I was about three years old, my great aunt Florence died. And my mother went to clean out Aunt Florence's apartment. She was a maiden lady. Nobody else in the family wanted to be bothered with cleaning out her place. She had been a reference librarian at the Grosvenor Library in my hometown of Buffalo. And she had a lot of interesting old stuff. And I liked going in our attic and poking around among the old stuff from Aunt Florence. And the most amazing stuff there, to me, was old photographs from our family from years ago. And one of these was a picture of my great-great-great-grandfather. His name was Heinrich Jakob Meyer. He came from Alsace. And he was born in 1799. I can still remember opening the dining room. In our dining room, there was a china cabinet, and I opened the drawer, and I found these pictures. My mother had been going through them. She'd recovered these from Aunt Florence's uh, place. By the way, I wasn't three anymore. I was more like 10. And I, I, I look at this picture. There was a picture, a photograph of this guy who was born in 1799. And that just blew me away. I just couldn't believe it. Then as I learned a little bit more about this history, I realized, well, he had lived well into the era of photography. He died in 1888 at the age of 89, which was a pretty good old age back then. That was the year my grandmother was born. She held me in her arms before she died. She had cancer. She died shortly after I was born. But she held me in her arms. She had been alive when Henry Meyer was alive. And it was just a couple people back. I only had one person between me and 1799. That's fascinating to me. I think these generations in time, this is all very fascinating to us. And you know, the Lord chose to make us dwellers in time. He chose not to make all of humanity at once in a flash, but he makes us come from parents and grandparents and great-grandparents back and back and back. It's a mystery to me how the Lord has chosen to do this. He's chosen to make us dwellers in time and to make things develop and sometimes progress, sometimes regress in time. Generation comes and generations go, but the Lord remains constant through them all. And as I think about history and time and generations, I wonder and I marvel at the eternal, everlasting Lord God, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who does not change. The mountains seem so massive and permanent to us, but before the mountains were born, it says in Psalm 90, or ever you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Can I have the next slide? This is in the Alps of uh, southeasternmost Germany, near Berchtesgaden and near Salzburg. And you see this sweep of mountains. And they seem so permanent to us, so abiding. God is greater and prior and older. <laughs> History is a great panorama, much larger than ourselves, yet much smaller than God. And he has the whole thing in his hand. Next slide, please. Psalm 90 goes on to say, you turn men back into dust. I don't know, while you were listening to that psalm, if you thought, well, that's kind of a downer after some pretty upbeat music. Did anybody think that? Okay, well, one or two. We are creatures of a little day. 
to God, a thousand years are like yesterday when it is gone, or like a watch in the night. The psalm says, like grass or like flowers, we sprout up in the morning, but we fade by evening. We're here today and gone tomorrow. It's not very long, folks. I know to you, especially those of you who are about 18 and visiting us here, I know it seems like this is going to go on for a very long time before I die. I remember when I started work. Uh, I worked for New York Life Insurance after I graduated from college, and I remember thinking at the age of 22, well, if I kind of work at the same place like my dad did all of his life, I've got, let me think, 22, 32, 42, 52, 62, mm, something like 40 plus years ahead of me. It just seemed like this long stretch of time. I've made my way through most of that already. And you will too, Lord willing. Our days fly away. Dust we are, and to dust we shall return. And in the study of history, and you see people come and go, and you kind of realize how transitory life is, I think it gives you a perspective on reality. The pride of our days, the psalmist says, is but labor and sorrow. Soon it is gone, and we fly away. Next slide, please. This is a grandmother and her grandson. That's my mother and my nephew back in 1987, standing at Brahman's Chinese Theater, where the stars of the silver screen of yesteryear would put their handprints and footprints in the cement and write their names. I don't suppose you can read the names, but the two there that I'm trying to show you, thank you, Sid, Fred Astaire, and over there, Ginger Rogers. Way up at the top is Lionel Barrymore. Over there is Sonia Henney. Probably many of you don't know those names. They were stars. They were adulated. People read every bit of gossip they could get about these people. And their signatures and their footprints and their handprints are preserved there in concrete for us. But they're gone, aren't they? Next slide. They're my mother's feet again on the beach at Santa Monica. And before, we had footprints set in concrete, you know, figuratively speaking, set in stone. Here they are set in sand. And within hours, a wave came and washed them away. There's an image of our footprint in the world. Do you know most of the people who have lived and died have left no trace for us in the record? History is remarkably selective. That may seem like a downer, too. One more, and then we'll try to be more upbeat. Next slide, please. These are flowers up on top of an alp in 1988. Fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, came and went about, hmm, well, let's see, what would that be, 25 times, 26 times? Long gone. In the hymn, O oh God, Our Help in Ages Past, based on Psalm 90, we sing, we blossom and flourish as leaves on the tree and wither and perish, but not changeth Thee. Nothing changes God. And I think the contemplation of past ages should lead us to awe and wonder at the eternal God. Next slide, please. So the, uh, I think, thematic verse of Psalm 90 is, teach us to number our days, that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. There is wisdom in facing the ephemerality, the transitoriness of our little lives. I'll have more to say about that little thing in a minute. Next slide. Confirm for us the work of our hands. We look to God to give meaning and purpose and satisfaction to our efforts in this brief lifespan. 
So the psalmist writes, Oh, satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. We depend on the Lord's loving kindness in this fleeting life. And we want our work to matter, confirm for us the work of our hands, even in view of what a short time we have. Don't we want our time to matter? Those of you who are launching out or about to launch out on a college career, don't you want your time to matter? And in studying history, we find that people's efforts have often made a great difference. I'd like to go now to another, the second of my passages, which is in Acts chapter 17. So next slide. This is when Paul uh, is talking to the Athenian philosophers on Mars Hill. And he says to them, he made from every nation, he made from one, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. He says a little more than that that I want to actually read to you. So hold on a second. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. This is a rather amazing thing. The first point I'm making here is we have a common humanity. He made from one, every nation of the earth. Christianity teaches us that all human beings come from one, right? From, from uh, the first man, Adam. And he made us all from the same person. We have a common humanity. We historians explore this common humanity in all its diversity over time and across the globe, learning more about ourselves as we do. And I thought maybe a fun way to think about this would be to show you the next slide. This is my great-great-uncle, Charlie. Yes, a little boy. Cultural norms change over time. This is the 1860s. Aunt Florence left us this old photo album with pictures of her father's generation from the Civil War years, 1860s. In the 1860s, in middle-class homes in Europe and America, all little children were dressed like this. They let little boys' hair grow in long sausage curls, or sometimes they'd actually have to curl it to make it do that, and they literally put them in dresses. There's a little bit of a vestige of this still. If any of you come from churches that baptize infants, sometimes you'll see infants presented for baptism in a baptismal dress, and they'll use the dress on boys or girls. It doesn't matter. That's like the last remaining vestige of this. This is not weird. I don't come from a, from a peculiar family. Uh, well, um, this is really how it was. Cultural norms change over time. Next slide, please. This is W.E.B. Du Bois, the great African-American leader. He was born in the Civil War times, 1865. He was born in a free black family in the north, western Massachusetts, middle-class family. Like Uncle Charlie, he's wearing, in this case, he's wearing stockings and pumps. Well, not pumps. What do you call those things? Shirley Temples. So there you go. Next slide, please. In that Acts 17 passage, it says, as I mentioned before, having determined God, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. This, to me, is a real cause for wonder. God is sovereign over history. We historians, even Christian historians, don't claim to be able to trace the particulars of God's purposes. But it is amazing to contemplate that Scripture says God determines the very boundaries of peoples and nations. Next slide. So, for example, here are the conquests of Alexander the Great in the late 4th century B.C. 
You know, the people being conquered weren't too happy about it, I don't suppose. Yet looking back on the whole thing, God determined even those boundaries for that time. What happens in history, God is in control of. Now, this is really something to contemplate. Next slide. Acts 17, 27 says he, he, uh, he did all this, that they should seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. God has made us whole people whose souls think and feel and choose and who are embodied in a real material world. But a reality that's not just material, but spiritual as well. God made us that we should seek God. Augustine says God uh, placed eternity in our hearts and made us uh, uh, restless until our souls rest in him. My Christian faith encourages me as a historian to explore the whole range of human experience, avoiding the reductionism of, say, economic or biological determinism. I have no problem seeing the influence of economics or biology, but I believe that human choices are also free, and that those choices also involve spiritual motives, whether good or evil. As a Christian, I view history, then, as a field of real drama. As image bearers of God make real choices that really matter. And the consequences can be enormous. History is full of huge issues and compelling drama, all based on a common humanity that we share as image bearers of the Creator. Next slide. Now to Exodus. This will go a little faster. The introduction to the Ten Commandments reads, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God is not just ruler over the whole earth. God made a covenant with his particular people. God has particular purposes in history, uh, especially to bless the whole world through the family of Abraham, then through Isaac, and Jacob or Israel, then through Judah to David, and through David to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the Messiah. In Scripture, God's people routinely recall the mighty deeds of God on their behalf. They recount what God did for them in history. Scripture is so full of history, if you think about it. And this same God will keep his promises today. And this history is real. I want to really make an, uh, a point of this. There are a lot of folks since the late 19th century, especially early 20th century, about 100 years ago, it came, became quite common to say, well, mm, you know, the Bible might not hold up to historical or scientific scrutiny. So what we need to do is we need to find some kind of spiritual essence of Christianity that transcends any claims of historical truth. So maybe we can say that, well, you know, maybe Jesus wasn't born of a virgin. Maybe he didn't really rise from the dead. But the story is so powerful. This idea of somebody being willing to die for the sins of others, that's a really powerful story. And we, it can still inspire us to emulate Christ. I just want to tell you that's not the gospel. We just sang about the one who died to take our sins and set us free. It really happened. Christianity is a gospel, and the word gospel means good news about something that God really did in real time among real human beings to really save us. Next slide, please. So thinking about this history, and I was in there with the Lord uh, bringing his people out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, I thought Cecil B. DeMille, right? So there's Pharaoh there, played by Yul Brynner. And that's all kind of a powerful story. We probably think of it in this kind of storybook way sometimes. Next slide, please. Ooh, that's grisly. That is the face of Ramesses II. Yes, we have the mummy of Ramesses II. There's some doubt as to who was the pharaoh of the Exodus, but a lot of people think Ramesses was. So you may right now be looking at the pharaoh who said no to Moses. 
Bibel zu mir. Next slide, please. I threw this in one. I threw this one in. I don't know. I, I like this one. This, believe it or not, is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. By my God, I can jump over a wall. I think that's great. <laughs> this verse may appear unspiritual, but I love it for its simple affirmation that God is at work in our actions. The sovereign God of providence uses and empowers human efforts to accomplish not only our will, but his. Next one, please. And how can I talk about God and history without talking about Psalm 139? Lord, you've searched me and known me. Further on in the psalm is this passage. In your book they were all written, the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Think of how your days are shaped not only by your decisions, but by myriad other choices, by other people, present and past. The more you think about it, the more mind-blowing it is. History is made up of innumerable events that we call contingent. Could have gone one way or another, depending on what people chose to do. And yet nothing is plainer in Scripture than that God rules over the whole thing. How can it be? that my days that are framed by all these decisions that, and actions that all these other people have done, contests and wars and elections and choices to, to migrate and all sorts of stuff, all that, and the days that, were, that God established for me are set, are written. He's got it all planned out. When is yet there was not one of them. Next slide, please. So to illustrate this, I thought I'd show you these two pictures from uh, the museum at Ellis Island. Ellis Island, of course, is the great place where a lot of uh, immigrants came in the late 19th, early 20th century into this country. And they've got this really cool uh, display where from the, one hand, from the one side, you're looking at this uh, flag, but it's got, mm, I don't know exactly what you call this, maybe holographic imagery or something. And as you walk, the flag starts turning into the faces. So you can see it happening there as my little daughter five years ago was walking by. To the next slide, please. And when you get to the other side, it's just all those faces. I thought, what a great depiction of America. And for that matter, what a great depiction of humanity and history. It's all these people, all these faces, making all these choices. And yet God sovereignly uses and governs the free choices. So, wait a minute, wait. Wasn't sovereignty and free will not supposed to go together? Well, they do. <laughs> Next slide, please. Matthew 2, 18. We just came through Christmas. This passage is at the tail end of Matthew's account of the Christmas story. We don't do this in the little plays with the kids with towels on their heads. Of course, this is very troubling. A voice was heard in Rama weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. This is the slaughter of the innocents. When Herod, a particularly vicious man, if you ever want to read more about him, read Josephus, the Jewish wars, Herod was a nightmare. Herod ordered the killing of every baby boy in the vicinity of Bethlehem to prevent the fulfillment of prophecy and the rise of a rival king of the Jews. While history is in the hand of God, people do horrible things. The study of history is full of tragedy, loss, oppression, hubris, and the word sin. We can't figure it all out. But for the sake of past victims and for the sake of future generations, we don't want historical evils to be forgotten. Next slide. This is the gate to Buchenwald, concentration camp. 
visit it with my wife that same year we were in Europe. This lies just outside Weimar, the great center of German culture. Goethe, the great German playwright and poet, lived in Weimar. And in the Nazi times, they built a concentration camp right outside. Mankind is the glory and the refuse of the universe, says Pascal, and he's right. Matthew, uh, Matthew 25, next slide. Jesus, of course, told his disciples about the end of days when he would come in glory to judge the earth. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, he will sit on his glorious throne. That should be his, not this, sorry. And all the nations will be gathered before him. As Christians, we believe this promise of our Lord Jesus, that he will come to set things right. Judgment will come, and it's his job, not ours. Historians don't presume to usurp Christ's place as ultimate judge. But we do have a task to discern right and wrong as far as we can. And as Christians, we have the only ultimate basis for saying there is goodness and there really is evil. If you don't believe in God, there isn't really good and evil. Whatever is, just is. How can you ground good and evil otherwise? But good, it really is good, and evil really is evil. They are real qualities, and there will be judgment. I want to conclude with a few thoughts about how historical study helps us as Christians. Next slide. So I'm going to talk about how it helps us to think Christianly and how it helps us to cultivate Christian virtues. Next slide. Historical study actually helps us to think Christianly. You see, I'm talking about the arrow going in two directions. History is a help to the Christian, and Christianity is a help to history. I've talked already from, from the uh, scripture about framing history. Now I'm going the other way. Historical study helps us to think Christianly because it opens up deep issues. History gives a great occasion to consider deep theological issues. The problem of evil, human nature, determinism and freedom of choice, nature and nurture, the inherent value of all people, the purposes of government and other social structures. What is justice and what is oppression? Next slide. Historical study helps us think Christianly in inviting practical application. We don't just philosophize about it. We see how it's worked out in the past. And we seek some lessons for how to apply it in our day. Next slide. Historical study helps us to think Christianly in encouraging identification with the other. One philosopher of history famously said, the, the past is a foreign country. And as we travel there, by means of an informed imagination, we place ourselves in the shoes of others. And we, just, we, uh, we cultivate that habit of being able to identify with the other. Next slide. So here's an image of a medieval manuscript of the first pages of the Quran. I don't want... As Christians, I don't want you to think about becoming a Muslim. That's not my point here. But we want to understand the other. History is a great uh, help in that. And next slide. Historical study helps us think Christianly in enriching and instantiating rather than competing with theological reflection. That's sort of my sum up of the thing. You know, we see these things actually work out in human history. We see what certain philosophies or ideologies do. Uh, and uh, history uh, synergizes beautifully with that kind of reflection. Next slide. Historical study, secondly, cultivates Christian virtues. I'm using a new book in my uh, class, uh, Understanding History, and John Fia says that historical study makes a modest contribution to our growth in holiness. Come join the history major and get sanctified. <laughs> okay? But it really does. Yeah, okay. You woke up. Thank you. 
a number of Christian historians have reflected on how historical study encourages the virtue of hospitality. That bit about walking in the shoes of others, uh, extending a kind of sympathy, uh, imaginative identification with the other, that's an act of hospitality. We encounter texts, we encounter many texts that strike us as strange because the people are thinking in ways that just don't seem like, you know, like we want to think that way. And we have to learn the discipline of extending a kind of um, thinking the best of the other and welcoming them in as people who may contribute to our growth too. Hospitality, next slide. Humility. I think this is probably the biggest one, actually, of the virtues cultivated by history. You discover how little you are. You discover how little you know. You discover how many other ways there are about thinking, uh, of thinking about things. It's a humbling experience, and that's a good thing. Next slide. In order to exercise hospitality and humility, you actually have to learn a little bit to deny yourself. Let the others speak. Be patient. And by the way, work hard to get it right. That involves discipline and self-denial. And final, uh, almost finally, next slide. All of this is a cultivation of love of neighbor. Your study can be an act of love. And lastly, Awe toward God, last slide. I hope I've portrayed for you some of the awe that I feel. An enlarged and deepened awe at the greatness of God as I look at these aspects of human history. So come, you're invited, whether in a gen ed or an upper level elective, or maybe as your major. I invite you to the feast that is history. Would you pray with me?